<clears throat> Welcome to the Folk School on Willow Creek, featuring University Distinguished Professor Tom Ezern, singing and telling stories from the Salon on Willow Creek. On the great western prairies, I do the work of the Lord. My saddle's my pillow, and I preach for my board. I ride by my compass, and I steer by star. Like the three holy wise men who followed that beacon and came from afar. I need a bed for the night, boy, and my horse and need hay. I've been riding the road. Now it's a Wyoming scatter, this flock on the land. Coyotes and grizzlies will steal all they can. But the Lord is my shepherd, I am his man. Still waters run deep in green pastures asleep under his garden hand. I need a bed for the night, boys, and my horses need hay. I've been riding that road line on a hot and dish highway. Now someday a white steeple gonna rise in the air. I'll preach from a pulpit, investment so fair. Thy grace is sufficient and constant I care. God bless this good land and the work of our hands establish it there. I need a bit for the night, boy, and my horses need hay. I've been a riding that road line on the hot dish highway. I need a bit for the night, boy. Highway. Well, only now and then did we sing the, uh, the full theme song for the Willow Creek Folk School, Hot Dish Highway. And it's, it's on occasion when the, con the, the, the content of the song itself happens to resonate with the content of the program to follow. And I think that's the case tonight. Um, I don't know, that, that last stanza, Dr. Kelly, do you recall where the texts come from for that last stanza? Thy grace is sufficient and constant thy care. God bless this good land and the work of our hand. I'm sorry. <clears throat> <sighs> what? Well, you may remember, you know, as far as being, you know, uh, planted in planted in the place, ground in the land, that those words uh, were spoken about thirty feet behind me, underneath this apple tree. Come on, woman. <laughs> Did it have anything to do with a wedding? <laughs> those are the two passages that our mothers spoke, read at that ceremony. Uh, came from uh, 2 Corinthians, my grace is sufficient. Yes. And from Psalm 90, establish thou the work of our hands upon us, yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Well, there's something there, see, about putting down roots. And that's why the full theme song for tonight, because he had to get to the last stanza and embarrass Dr. Kelly, she can't remember the, the, the texts for her own wedding. Welcome to Willow Creek Folk School number 129 on the 17th of February 2023 from the salon on Willow Creek right to the Facebook timeline, my own, and you're there of course, otherwise you're not even hearing me say this. And we're operating under the heading tonight, country. Now I do not mean Randy Travis, 
I do not even mean Hank Williams. I'm talking about country in a larger sense. Something like that last stanza from Hot Dish Highway. And the, what, what brought this to mind was we realized, oh, oh man, this, is, this, is, this week is the, the, the birthday of Banjo Patterson, Australia's great bush balladeer. And we'll be singing a couple of his songs tonight. But I got to thinking about that word country, which, you know, it means certain things in this land, in this country, but it, in Banjo Patterson's country, it means something else. And it's going to broaden, the program's going to broaden out to several different continents yet tonight. But I got to reading about the, that word country as it, and what it connotes in uh, the Banjo's own country. Uh, he was born and raised in New South Wales, Australia, of course. And a, a, a helpful article from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation here about country and the resonance of that word. And when people speak that word in Australia, it, okay, it, it's as if a Dakota or Lakota person here would say the word Makochi, you know, homeland, country. Not some definite lines on the map. map. It's more a resonance with, with the soil. And the word country in Australia, as the settler society has come to you, come to use it, as modern Australians, both Aboriginal and Euro-Australian and now Asian-Australian, use the word country, it really originates from uh, the, the uh, uh, Aboriginal people of the land, from the indigenous people of Australia. Uh, country. Now, in this country, it's, seen, it's fairly stylish for a place like a university, Dr. Kelly, or perhaps it'll happen at the NDSU press party here in a couple weeks, to have an acknowledgement of country, acknowledgement of uh, original indigenous title and ongoing redig in indigenous interest and a degree of possession of the land despite European occupation. Uh, country in Australia means something a little bit different, and it comes directly from um, indigenous usage. Uh, people who had crossed the country then, an indigenous tribe in Australia, following a song line from one area to another, one resource area perhaps to another, another ritual area to another, they would encounter people uh, of another tribe. Someone would go ahead and seek permission to enter that territory. Elders would come forward from the country being visited, and they would conduct a welcome to country ceremony, meaning, okay, you come on in, it's all right, and we're going to keep an eye on you. Not just in the sense of a critical sense, but actually, we're going to keep an eye on you and make sure other people don't mess with you, or don't, that our own people understand you're here on, 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 on permission and everything's cool. That's a welcome to country ceremony. And those happen in Australia on all sorts of occasions yet. A group that's going to hold a meeting somewhere in central Australia might uh, invite uh, 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 Arenta elders to come in and conduct a welcome to country ceremony. On the other hand, uh, in a, on a more casual uh, meeting, let's say with um, uh, Euro-Australian people uh, somewhere, they might simply do an acknowledgement. And that's commonly what happens in this country. Just an acknowledgement of the original people of the land. But that word country is spoken with a certain cadence that I won't try to replicate in Australia. Uh, and it's spoken by both indigenous and Euro-Australian and now Asian-Australian people of the land. And I think that's a good preface to talk about Banjo Patterson. I'll be singing in a moment a poem by uh, Andrew Barton Patterson, the banjo, as he's commonly known, a poem called Clancy of the Overflow, which is published originally in the Sydney Bulletin in 1889, and then published in book form in the collection of poems, The Man from Snowy River. Okay, now we're starting to touch some chords that re resonate with people. It's a companion piece to the epic poem, The Man from Snowy River, but I think 
Clancy of the Overflow is far superior as a ballad. Uh, Clancy, are we talking about a real person? Well, the banjo said, ah, no, all my poems are just pure inventions. They don't resemble real people or real life anywhere. It's just kind of the, you know how authors are, right? Like these authors and, and us, we're, we're all full of it, right? And, and a, in this character Clancy figures both in The Man from Snowy River and in Clancy of the Overflow. Clancy is your classic Australian bushman, equal to any situation. The person to whom everyone else looks in a time of decision. And he is, of course, based upon Thomas Clancy, an overseer and drover in central New South Wales, uh, operating in, from the 1860s to 1880s there. And the connection is Benjo Patterson was a solicitor, meaning he's like, he's not a barrister, like arguing cases, criminal cases and that sort of stuff. He's a solicitor. You get this guy to do your will or to do your taxes and that sort of thing, to handle your deed work. And I think Patterson himself would say, kind of dull work. Well, he handled the will for Thomas Clancy, this uh, uh, station master and drover from New South, uh, New South Wales. Um, because he did his, his will, he was familiar with his biographical details, and I suppose he felt a little bit licensed to use the name. Uh, I, I, his family does not object to this, by the way. And they get a little ticked off when people say, oh, that's not really who he's writing about. I'm pretty sure this is who he's writing about. That will is a direct connection. Now, Andrew Barton, Patterson, the banjo, born in 1864. Um, he's described as a poet, first of all, as we know him, but he's also a, 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 a solicitor, a, a, a journalist, a wartime correspondent, a soldier for a while during the Great War uh, in the Middle East, uh, a vet, a, 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 an inveterate and master horseman, uh, his father was a lowland Scot who had immigrated to Australia in about 1860, I believe. He had, uh, banjo, the banjo enjoyed a bush boyhood. He was known as Barty as a kid. He had a lifelong enthusiasm for horses and horsemanship, and it always shows up. Uh, you know, a man from Snowy River, you maybe have seen the movie. 1874, he was sent from the bush into Sydney to go to boarding school, to get a proper education, and he never really left Sydney, except for his various travels, which were fairly global. As a young man, he became fairly well known on the Sydney social scene as quite a man about town and on the sporting scene. Horse racing, boxing, polo, any kind of <clears throat> manly sport. The banjo was there. He was on holiday in 1895 in Queensland with his fiancée, and they visited a station called Dagworth Station near uh, Winton. And it's there that he wrote another song we'll get to yet tonight, Waltzing Matilda. Uh, his journalistic chops, he, uh, he honed those during the Boer War in South Africa in 1898. As I say, he served in, uh, as a, in the, ser he was in service himself in the Middle East during the First World War. This is Banjo Patterson. I'm trying to think of anyone who, who can compare him to exactly. Now, here in the Great Plains, yeah. Uh, I, I would compare him mm, to Badger Clark uh, of South Dakota as being a poet of the land. And is he really a folk poet? Well, some would argue that. No, no, he's, he's, he's writing for publication. All of our balladeers on the Great Plains wrote for publication. They sent their stuff to the local newspapers. That's not what the definition of a folk song is. Uh, it's not disqualified because he wrote for publication. Uh, the proposition is that the song goes into circulation. And uh, Patterson's poems became songs and circulated as songs, as folk songs, as ballads. Well, Clancy of the Overflow. What, the, what is the overflow? That is a sheep and cattle station out on the Lachlan River, inland in Australia. And a couple of lines need, may need some explanation. Uh, 
Patterson writes of receiving a letter written with a, <laughs> let me take this pick off, written with a thumbnail dipped in tar. I, I just love that image there, writing a letter with, uh, what, what's the deal with the tar? He's writing to a, a shearing barn, the, 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 the message is coming from a shearing barn, and the shearers, as they were clipping the fleeces, kept on hand a bucket of tar, because they're always, it's like a shaving nick uh, to the power of three, they're always nicking the skin on the sheet. And to close that up quickly, they, dap, they, they dap a brush, dip a brush in tar and dab it on there and close the cut. Thumbnail, dipped in tar, writing the letter. I'd like to see that letter. Uh, what else is in here that needs a bit of explanation? Oh, well, you know, the, remember that uh, Patterson is a, uh, uh, a solicitor. He's kind of an office-bound lawyer most of his life, but he has friends back in the bush in his own home country. I had written him a letter Which I had for want of better knowledge sent To where I met him down the Lachlan years ago He was shearing when I knew him So I sent the letter to him Just on the spec addressed as follows Clancy of the Overflow and an answer came directed in a writing unexpected and I think the same was written with a thumbnail dipped in tar was a shearing maid who wrote it and verbatim I will quote it Clancy's gone to Queensland droving and we don't know where he are In my wild erratic fancy visions come to me of Clancy Gone a droving down the Cooper where the western drovers go And the stock are slowly stringing Clancy rides behind them singing for the drovers life has pleasure that the townsfolk never know. And the bush hath friends to meet him, and their kindly voices greet him. In the murmur of the breezes and the river on its falls. And he sees the vision blended of the sun the plains extended. And at night the wondrous glory of the everlasting stars. I'm sitting in my dingy little office where stingy ray of sunlight struggles feebly down beneath the houses tall. And the fitted air and gritty dusty, dirty city Through the open window Floating spreads its foulness over all And in place of the lowing cattle I can hear bandage rattle Of the tramways and the buses Making hurry down the street And the language on inviting the gutter children fighting comes fitfully faintly through the ceaseless tramp to be and the hurrying people taunt me and their pallid faces haunt me as they shoulder one another in their rush and nervous haste with their eager eyes Born and needy. The townsfolk have no time to grow, they have no time to waste. And I somehow 
rather fancy that I'd like to change with Clancy. Like to take a turn at droving where the seasons come and go. While he faced around eternal, not the cash book and the journal, but I doubt he'd suit the office. Clancy of the overflow. Well, is that a ballad, Dr. Kelly, or what? I like it in particular because it's a pistol, an epistolary ballad. Old-time letter writing is the scene. And, you know, that's got to be a theme for a future Willow Creek Folk School, epistolary ballads, meaning ballads where a letter is the whole hinge, the hinge of the plot line. And, and, and that's going to happen one of these days. It might be next summer by the time it happens. God willing, we're all still around. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, what are these books doing here, Dr. K? We decorate with books. Yeah. Well, in the summer we decorate with books. Yeah, the poems in us are played, played out, so we're gone to books, <laughs> which are eternal. <laughs> Got anything to say about them? I do. Someone already remarked on radium, so that means they can read the, the text from their, their screen. Well, hold this one up and they can read it, which is... Maybe so. The Clean Daughter, a cross-continental memoir by Joe Candell. And Radium is by a young fella just starting out in the novel writing world. This is his debut novel, um, John Anger. Uh, some people will recognize the Anger family name because there are other writers. This who, is a literary... The DNA. <laughs> it may be. Yeah. Well, he grew up with it. And he, as he said in an interview, I grew up thinking it was all right to do this. It was all right to be a writer and yeah. a reader. <laughs> and so that's pretty cool. <coughs> These are two of the authors that will be at our, N our eighth annual NDSU press party. And people who are viewing this program on mm -hmm. my timeline on Facebook, if you look above it, you will see a link to NDSU Press homepage with big banner headline, the NDSU Press Party, coming up what day again? March 2nd. The first Thursday in March is when we do this. Who's shouting the drinks? <laughs> uh, we'll have a professional in to, to handle the drinks. Not a professional drinker. <laughs> a professional Oh, I'm sure some will show up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have... Uh, Oh, I just ordered quite a few hundred dollars worth of hors d'oeuvres. Uh -huh. A lot. We've got smokies and meatballs and deviled eggs and salads and all kinds of stuff to welcome people in. As they walk in the door, they'll be hearing Cat Sank Trio singing. Um, I'm hoping Crystal brings her flute. She does a beautiful job with her oh, whistle. It's a whistle, oh, the, not the, a the trio, they're, 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 they're yeah. wonderful for this kind of behavior. They really are. And they've come out of retirement just for our party. Now, here are a couple of fine books that have done well for the press already. Yes. Um, both yes. As, just as being quality works and beautiful books, uh, like usual from NDSU Press, but also it, it actually sold a fair number. Yeah. Of the, what an unusual thing for a university <laughs> press, actually, selling books and... And they're getting sweet reviews, too. And I don't know what's going to happen with that. What's the book from Fort Ransom? Dust Yourself Off. You ordered another printing yet? I did. So we had... Um, a, 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 it's not an atypical to order about $600, 600 books excuse me, for a first run. Yeah, for those, those who are unacquainted with University Press Publishing... This is not Random House, folks. <laughs> We're not ordering millions of copies. Right. We order what we feel like we can sell. We ordered 600, and uh, we haven't even received those yet. They'll arrive. They've been sent from the printer, but we haven't received them yet. But our orders for that um, almost wiped out that whole 600 copies. So it's in for a second printing. And it's not, it's, it's not even in print in this book. Now you want to do the second printing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll have six books that are represented at the party, but that actually means about 20 authors' works in I can kind of get that. the night off, don't I? I just kind of... You can sit back and relax Graze through the hors d'oeuvres and... <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And there'll be cake. Indeed. 
uh, I have a, I always try to find what talents and skills my interns have and we try to build on that and also let them explore new kinds of learning activities that they want to do. Well, this time one of my students is a professional caterer. He works for NDSU Catering. So he's taking over that whole business for me. He's taking care of the um, arrangements. You mean we don't have to cook for this? Yeah, we don't have to cook for it, no. <laughs> We're hoping lots of people will come. Yeah, do. Come on over. Uh, McGovern Alumni Center on University Avenue. That's right. Across from NDSU. The same place we've always had it if you've come before. Uh, a little bit more about Banjo Patterson and uh, whose birthday we're celebrating tonight, but tying that with the general theme of ties to the land, of country. Uh, his name is forever entwined with that of Yule Francois Archibald. Uh, but that's kind of a bogus name. He was born in uh, Victoria, Geelong, Victoria, in 1856, and he has an English name. But Fairly early in life, he became enamored of French culture and renamed himself <laughs> Yule Francois and, uh, and, and passed as a Frenchman for much of life. Uh, he wanted to be a journalist. He apprenticed as a printer and then began writing stories and submitting them to other papers besides the one that he was printing for. He left uh, his home area for a Melbourne. Um, uh, he rattled around the country a great deal. He worked as a clerk in government offices. He uh, went, went out to uh, Cooktown, uh, went up to Cooktown and then inland from there, that's in, in Queensland, into uh, the mining regions, which was a, a brief outback experience, but was enough that it made him enamored of bush life in Australia. Eventually drifted into Sydney and there was a co-founder of the Sydney Bulletin. I don't know if you remember, Dr. Kelly, but we have stood in front of the door of the original Sydney Bulletin office. On I do remember. A little obscure square in Sydney. The walls, the out, the exterior was plastered with images of the newspaper. Yeah, there you are. Columns and, but it wasn't in operation, was it? No, no, no. Uh, first issue of the Bulletin came out on January 31st of 1880. And you'll notice the Banjo's publication career is in the 1880s. They are intertwined. He brought on a fellow named uh, A.G. Stevens, who put in charge of kind of the literary page of the bulletin, which is supposed to be kind of a smart, urban, sophisticated paper, if you can have such in Australia in the 1880s. They were giving it, giving it a shot. But the Bush poets kind of took over the literary page. And Stephen began to encourage this. He realized, well, there's a heck of a lot of people with ties to the bush, and even the people who are pretty much just Sydney people, they come over from England, here they are in Sydney, they've never really been to the bush. They believe that that's the heart of Australia, and it's, it's an identity maker. Um, Archibald, through Stephen, had a whole stable of writers then. Uh, um, you know, uh, um, not, not just Banjo Patterson, but Henry Lawson was the other one most prominent, but quite a number of other Bush poets, Bush essayists who were writing in there and sometimes debating the virtues and the faults of Bush life. Okay, so here's uh, the, the solicitor. He's found an outlet. He's writing and publishers are now interested. 1895, the banjo was traveling with his fiancée, touring some cattle stations. He thought she perhaps should see a bit of the bush, and they went up to a cattle station in central Queensland. This is well back from the coast. And in January 1895, he arrived at Dagworth Station near present-day Winton. Now, this is about a 400-square-mile cattle property, cattle and sheep property. And there he met an old schoolmate of his fiancée named Christina McPherson, who played an Irish folk song, Craigily, on a zither that Patterson liked. And then there was a series of events like uh, Bob McPherson, uh, then who was manager of the station, took Patterson 
out to a billabong, a water hole, and there was the skin of a newly, uh, there was the, the, the rotting skin of a dead sheep there, and all this stuff began to turn, and it resulted in a poem, which then the proprietress of the station, Christina, set to a, uh, fixed up at the score to the tune of Craigie Lee, the Scottish song. And it was first sung in public for a banquet for the premiere of Queensland on the 6th of April, 1895, and away it went. And away it went. And it, it, it's morphed through oral tradition. I'll be singing the version as it's commonly sung in Australia today. This song, by the way, it's got some vocabulary in it, I should mention. I'm calling it a post-colonial vocabulary. Uh, you'll find poets of the land sometimes deploy terminology. Yeah, Badger Clark did this, and other poets here do the same thing. That is designed to mystify outsiders. So people who are not from there won't know what the heck you're talking about. Once a jolly swagman. What's a swagman? What's a swagman, Dr. Kelly? I don't know. Well, I'll for peace <laughs> sake. Uh, a I swag. Remember. It's a bedroll. You got your bedroll over your okay. back. Camped by a billabong. Water. Yeah, what we call a slough in North Dakota, right? We went out fishing on Corroboree Billabong, remember? I do. And we saw a Crocodile. And we didn't catch any of the elusive Barabundi. Barabundi, no. But it was a great day, nevertheless. Waited while his billy boiled. Brewing some tea in a can, the billy. Mm -hmm. You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. Now we're coming to the core, but what the heck is a Matilda? That's that bedroll. That's the swag. Okay, the joke is, if you're a traveling man, a swagman in Australia... The closest you'll ever get to lying down with a woman is to lie down with that bedroll on the ground. And so they gave the name mm -hmm. Matilda to that bedroll. Matilda and I are going to... Matilda and I are going to stretch out here and see. And so hence, uh, waltzing Matilda. Oh, once jolly swagman Come by Billabong Under the shade of a Kulaba tree He sang as he watched And waited while his Billy boiled You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me Waltzing Matilda Waltzing Matilda You'll come a waltzing Matilda with me He sang as he watched Waiting while it's Billy Wild You'll come a watching Matilda with me Well down come a chum buck to drink at the billabong Up jump the swagman and grub him with glee And he sang as he stuffed that jump buck in his tucker bag You'll come a watching Matilda with me Waltzing Matilda, Waltzing Matilda, you come waltzing Matilda with me. He sang as he stuffed the jump buck in his tucker bag. You come a waltzing Matilda with me. Now up rode the squatter. Mounted on his thoroughbred, up rode the troopers, one, two, three. Now is that jolly jumbuck you got in your tucker bag? You come a waltzing Matilda with me, a waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda. You come a waltzing Matilda with me. Where's that jolly jumbuck you got in your tucker bag? You come a watching Matilda with me. Now up jumped the swagman, sprang into the billabong. You'll never take me alive, said he. 
in his voice may be heard as you pass by that billabong. Come walk to Matilda with me. <laughs> this is the unofficial Australian national anthem. No Australian could actually sing Advance Australia Fair for you, but they can all sing waltzing. Can you sing Advance? Only Advance Australia Fair. That's all I, all I know. <laughs> okay. I can come closer with the New Zealand national anthem. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got any friends on the chat line here tonight? Did you know that Lynn Buling was a sheep shearer? In this country? I don't know. In what country? Well, I presume in this country, huh? <laughs> yeah. Lynn's sheared a few sheep, has he? Has he made 200 a day? Because a good shearer in Australia, Australasia will get 200 a day. My goodness. Yeah, I'm not, I don't doubt it. Lynn's done a lot of stuff. He's been a custom wheat harvester also, as I recall. Oh, and you know he carves those beautiful figurines? Oh, indeed. Yeah, he's a master <laughs> wood carver. And he's a yeah, writer? Poet, essayist, writer. Yeah. He's kind of scary, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I don't see Taylor on here. I'm not sure if he's with us tonight, but I did see an announcement that he's going to be at Zambro's on March 21st. Taylor Brewery? Taylor Brewery, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Sounds like a date, Taylor. Yeah, we'll buy him a drink, I suppose. Huh? <laughs> We're hopping continents here in a moment because we got another, you know, anniversary to celebrate, sort of. It's the date that led to the settlement of Germans in South Russia, in the Voyarussia, Neurussland, New Russia, or as the Germans who settled there called it, Sudrussland, South Russia. We're really talking about what we know as Ukraine today, all right? Which had, in the, by the mid 19th century, had been conquered by the Russian Empire. And it was an area for settlement in the same way that the United States, about the same time, was trying to attract foreign settlers to come in and take up land in crazy places like North Dakota. The Russian government was actually inviting people toward a rather attractive, attractive farmland, Sud Russland. Russian Tsar Alexander the set first came to power in 1801, but it was Alexander II, or it, but it was Alexander I who in 1804 reissued the edict of his grandmother, Catherine the Great, her manifesto that brought the original crop of Germans in to settle along the Volga River Valley. And then, so they're renewing the call. We have additional frontier lands to be settled up. Only colonists that were allowed in were ones who are certified as capable agriculturalists or artisans. Uh, what's the deal for the new colonists under Alexander's proclamation? Complete religious freedom? Uh, the Mennonites were heavily represented in those Black Sea colonies, and this was a big thing to them, obviously. Exemption from taxes for 10 years, exempt from the military service, Nobody wants to go to the Russian army then or now. Um, advan- uh, loans, for operating loans to, for, uh, for developing properties originally. You have 10 years to pay them off. 
every family got a, cra- uh, a grant of, uh, you know, what in terms of English acres be 70 acres or more, at least around 70 acres, of productive land. And uh, not only did you have to be a skilled farmer or artisan, but only families were allowed to immigrate. Single guys need not apply. Mm. So it is somewhat different from the homesteading frontier. Uh, there is no little old sod shanty on the claim with a lonely bachelor on it in Sud Rusland. But it does have its balance, as do the American plains. And I'm about to give you one. One we've sung before, Kein Schöneland, meaning no better place would be loose translation for it. No finer land than this one. And it's a sign of, it's kind of a self satisfied song. Here we are, sitting under the grove of trees, specifically linden trees, you get that, linden trees, that we planted ourselves and now we're enjoying the fruits of our labors and we're really pleased with ourselves. All these people will come to grief eventually. If not in the 1870s when conscription begins and they began to leave and emigrate to here, for instance, that's why we have the um, Schwarzmeer Deutsche, the Black Sea Germans, here in North and South Dakota and in Saskatchewan also. Uh, But uh, even worse is if they stayed and they came to true grief than in the 20th century with the political and military turmoil that swept across their land. But this is a song of happier times. And it travels here with a sort of an irony because of its reference to mature groves of linden. But, uh, yeah. So I think this is a song of longing for the old country, of Germans who had gone to Sudwurstland, gone to South Russia, and thence here to the North American plains, and and that first generation, they're they're, they're thinking about the old country. And the song arrives here, and it's actively sung. I learned it from this collection by Joseph Haidt, uh, to my German-Russian friends, a well-known name, the great ballad collector of the Germans from Russia. He was a Saskatchewan German-Russian himself. Uh, I never met him. I corresponded with his daughter, however. Um, he includes in his book translations of this song, Kind Chinerland and others, they aren't singable translations, however. They're reasonable. They're good uh, translations as to content, but I needed the singable one, and there was none out there. And so, you know, this translation... I'm going to sing the German stanzas, in each case then followed by my own, what I regard as singable translation. Pretty darn close to content, but I don't know if you've ever done this kind of thing. You know, it cannot be exactly replicated. Kein schöner Land for all, all my German Russian friends. Kein schöner Land in dieser Zeit, als hier das unsere Weit und Breit, wo wir uns finden, wo unter Linden zu Abend sein. Wo wir uns finden, wo unter Linden zu Abend sein. In this delightful countryside, may we forever here abide. What joy to gather in our groves of Linden at eventide. What joy to gather in our groves of linden at eventide. Da haben wir so manche Stund gesessen da in Frau Heron und taten singen die Lieder klingen in Eichengrund und taten singen die Sweeter songs are there than these. Meet 
cast upon the prairie breeze. Our hearts are singing, the music ringing among the trees. Our hearts are singing, the music ringing among the trees. Thus the ones here in decent trial look treth and so feel hunted mal. Gut mag es schenken, gut mag es lenken, er hat die Gnade. Gut mag es schenken, gut mag es lenken, er hat die Gnade. God grant our gatherings shall grow, our children reap what we shall sow. God speed your boundless love descending as a dove and make it so. God speed your boundless love descending as a dove and make it so. Nun Brüder eine gute Nacht, der Herr im hohen Himmel wacht, in seine Güte und zu behüten ist er bedacht. In seiner Güte und zu behüten ist er bedacht. Now, brethren, bid we you good night. The Lord will have us in his sight. Wherever we may roam, he bathes our pathway home with loving light. Wherever we may roam, he bathes our pathway home with loving light. And may we all be watched over on our way home. Have we forgotten anything tonight, Dr. K? Then we're going to proceed to this, tonight's uh, calendar ballad. You know, started in near two years ago, years ago with the determination, oh, just about every week to try to come up with a, an original ballad suitable for the uh, occasion. Sometimes we repeat one. I think forever, every August, September, we have to sing Friday Night Lights, you know, and some things like that. But it is a fresh one tonight. Oh, I wish I had a dollar for every section road I have followed through patchwork quilt our Lord Creator sewed. For the gravel and the gumbo, I did not regret a mile. Because when you leave the blacktop, then you're traveling in style. Now I wish I could remember Every story I have heard, I would build a great library, encoding every word. From a pulpit or a bar stool, your tale is worth my time. If I don't believe your stories, why would you believe mine? If I should write a ballad to tell just who we are, it would have to name each character and every prairie star. I would not leave out the blemishes, I'd sing it warts and all. If a ballad be not honest, then it is no song. Deer in the 
little more, please. Drove in where the seasons come and go. Come on, watch in the tail. We now conclude today's edition of the Folk School on Willow Creek. We invite you to join us again next Friday at 8 p.m. Central Time for more songs and stories.